Number one, keep learning. Seek knowledge, seek wisdom. Learning is itself a pleasure. And when you can also have the gift of converting what you learn into something that helps others, that just amplifies the pleasure. And that's something you can take delight in. The credit is perhaps too kind to go to me. While I came up with the name Affective Computing and I wrote a book by that title to try to interest a lot of people in working on it, the field today has thousands of people who've contributed to making it what it is. And it really wouldn't be here without the enormous efforts of many others. When, when I was first thinking about Affective Computing, the thought was not to make computers that were emotional. The thought was actually to try to make computers that showed greater respect for human intelligence, including the important role that emotions play in human intelligence. That was a surprising role at the time. I was trying to actually figure out how to build a computer that could see better. And as I studied how the human visual cortex worked and perception worked in audition uh, and other sensory inputs, I learned about synesthesia and the crossing of the senses that happens in some people, like people who, when they taste soup, feel shapes in their hand. And as I tried to figure out what was going on in the brain, I learned that the processing in the brain was involving deep regions that were the center of emotion, memory, and attention. And I thought, ah, memory and attention, those are really important. And emotion, I wanted to be taken seriously as a woman in science and engineering, and I did not want to be associated with emotion. Unfortunately, it turned out that emotion was the key thing that so many of our artificial intelligence algorithms were completely missing. And I think the more I learned about it, the more I realized that in order to make intelligent language processing, intelligent computer vision, intelligent perception, intelligent interaction with people, and many other things AI was not succeeding at, we were gonna need to figure out emotional intelligence and the roles that emotions play deep in our brains in regulating intelligent thinking, even when people don't appear emotional at all. There's a proverb that says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And as a regular reader of Proverbs and the Old and New Testament, I find great inspiration in those. And so when I find myself feeling a lot of pride, I usually try to uh, push that down and think about you know, the many gifts I've been given in terms of uh, different ways of thinking and connections and ability to do things. What a gift that is. And each of us is given these gifts. And with those gifts comes enormous responsibility. So while I'm super happy to see a lot of the successes that are happening, I can't take credit for it. And neither do I want to feel a puffed up sense of pride. I want instead to think about what a responsibility I have to try to make sure that this progress is used for good purposes. It's very scary when something becomes rapidly adopted and used for a lot of good, but also some people take it and want to use it for enhancing their own power, for their own wealth, for their own, uh, you know, pride, really. Uh, and that is not what gives great satisfaction in life. Uh, the greatest satisfaction doesn't come from being proud of something you've done. It comes from helping other people succeed in their lives and giving them the opportunity to be more than they can be, to be healthier, to be happier, to have deeper relationships. Uh, and that's hard work and we need everybody working on that. So yeah, it's awesome. There's been a lot of success, uh, but we still have a lot of work to do.
One of the greatest privileges of my work has been to get to know people on the autism spectrum and people with epilepsy and people with neurological conditions that some people say are really debilitating and at times they are. Uh, but at other times these conditions like autism can actually enable people to see the world in different ways that are really wonderful and ways we can all learn from. In working with people who suffer from uh, epilepsy, you know, who have seizures that rob them of uh, their consciousness, their ability to uh, stand up, uh, and other really awful, awful, unpleasant things. Um, I have been so inspired by the families and the strength and their heroic actions. Uh, but I also see that we need to end epilepsy. We need to help people figure out why most of the time they're not having seizures uh, and try to prevent those times that they do. When we were working actually with people with autism, trying to help them be better understood, uh, we accidentally found that we were picking up with our early version of this device, changes in electrical activity on the skin that indicated something going on deep in the brain that we did not expect to find. And when we found that and we built AI machine learning to run on board to detect it together with the motion, we realized that we could actually detect seizures using a smartwatch running AI. Now with that, we could also alert somebody to come and help at the moment of a seizure. And that's important because the deaths from seizure are taking more years of potential life than all neurological disorders except stroke. More than Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, meningitis, encephalitis, uh, and multiple sclerosis. And these deaths are less likely to happen if somebody's there at the time of the seizure. So we want to detect the seizure, call a friend, have you sign up to be a friend for somebody you know who has epilepsy? And then you can come there and be there and give them first aid or even just stimulation at the moment that they're having a seizure and make sure they're okay and give them hopefully a better chance of coming out of that seizure just fine. One morning I was reading my email and I got an email from a mom who was testing an early version of our device and it said, that she was in the shower, you know, washing her hair, and she saw her phone go off on the counter near the shower. Uh, it said her daughter might be having a seizure. And so she runs out of the shower, goes to her daughter's bedroom, finds her daughter face down in bed, blue and not breathing, flips her daughter over on her side, and her daughter takes a breath and another breath, and she turns pink again. And the mother sees her daughter has just had a seizure and her daughter is now fine. After she makes sure she's okay, she comes back to me and emails and says, what happened? And I, I think my breath stopped. I responded and said, oh no, you know, it's not a perfect device. What if the battery dies? What if it becomes disconnected? You can't trust it will always catch these. And she says, it's okay. I know no technology is perfect. Uh, but this device just got me there in time to save my daughter's life. And I felt so joyful that our team was able to work together and take what started off as just kind of a crazy finding in the lab, actually with a boy taking our sensor home and seeing his little brothers having this big response. Uh, you know, the hand-built sensor that looked really crazy. In fact, I have the um, first version of it here I brought out. This is the original, the sweat van with home-built electronics wrapped with uh, tape, okay? Through many, many iterations, uh, it has become now a beautiful wearable device that's FDA cleared and tells time, counts steps, is a really sophisticated smartwatch, but has real-time AI that can detect those dangerous events and summon through your smartphone uh, a friend, a community member, a family member who can be there 
and deliver potentially life-saving first aid. Technology needs women. It needs us so much. Technology takes on the characteristics of those who shape it, of those who make it, often in their own image. And if that image is only a male image, then so much of our technology won't serve society as well as it can, as when women think about what kind of experience they want to create and we shape it both in our image and in the image of everyone around us. So technology more than ever needs people of all types to participate and look at what it could do to dream of what it could be and think about shaping it to be the kind of future experiences, to create the kind of future experiences that we all want to have and not just let it evolve on its own, uh, which is not likely to give us really great experiences. Our work at Empatica actually came from trying to solve a completely different problem. One day I was talking with a friend with autism. Actually, she was typing because she couldn't speak. And I said to her, you know, in all this, all this literature, all these scientific papers, they say that it's people with autism who have difficulty understanding other people's emotions. And she said, Roz, you have it all wrong. Uh, my biggest problem is not understanding other people's emotions. She said, my biggest problem is you are not understanding my emotions. And I felt about this big, and I thought, oh gosh, you know, I work on emotion. I'm so sorry. I thought I was better at it than that. Um, what am I not understanding? And she said, it's not just you, <laughs> it's everybody. Still didn't feel that much better. Uh, she said, everybody is misunderstanding my emotions. So what are we missing? She said, you're missing my stress. I am experiencing enormous stress and you're missing it. And I thought, she looks calm. She looks pretty chill. Uh, and I realized that we had in the lab skin conductance sensors, usually measuring on the palm, the fingers, or the bottom of the feet, uh, slight changes in sweat gland activity that happen even when you don't feel sweaty. Uh, we can pick up these electrical changes that tend to go up when you feel stress. So I thought, I wonder if we gave her a sensor that measures that and visualizes it for others if she could be better understood. And she liked that idea. So we went back to the lab and we made it so that it would stream the data in real time. And sure enough, people could suddenly see that when she looked very calm, her level might be sky high. And when she rocked or engaged in other activities that some people thought were not, you know, like helpful, uh, that her level sometimes went down like a slide on the playground. We saw with children in classrooms, what things made them go up, what things made them dead down. And they could show the teacher what was stressing them out, what was calming them. Or a person with ADHD, it turns out, may have really low electrodermal activity. And they may jump up and down and do really active things that might scare you um, to get their electrodermal activity just to climb up to a normal range. So by giving people this technology to understand better what was going on inside themselves, and if they felt safe to share it with somebody outside, hey, hey, look, this is what's happening to me, uh, then they could be better understood. So starting with that work, we gave it to a young man in my lab who wanted to borrow a sensor for his little brother over Christmas. And he takes the sensor home, puts it on his little brother. I'm back at MIT looking at the boy's data on my screen, uh, thinking, here's a kid with severe autism who can't talk and he's got actually pretty low electrodermal activity, pretty chill. I thought he's having a really relaxing vacation, it looks like to me. 
And the next day was the same. And I look at the next day and each day's data looked, looked pretty flat. And I go to the next day and my jaw drops. The boy was wearing sensors on both wrists. And usually the two sides look the same. And one side was very low. And the other side shot up so high that I thought, sensor must be broken. I'd never seen a response that big in my whole life. And we had stressed people out at MIT in every way we could think of, you know, qualifying exams, loud noises in their ears, uh, Boston driver stress, and nothing had ever caused such a big peak. So as I looked at the data more and more, I couldn't figure out what caused it. And it didn't actually look like the sensor was broken. The data was working fine before and after. And I'm an electrical engineer by training, so I did a, some other tests to try to figure out what could cause that kind of an increase. Uh, it wasn't a simple short circuit. And finally, I gave up on my debugging and I went and I called the big brother of the wearer at home. And I said, hey, do you know what happened to your little brother at this date and time? And he said, I don't know, I'll check the diary. And I go uh, and wait, like, what are the odds? he's written this down um, and he comes back and he says the exact date and time and he says that's right when he had a grand mall seizure I started to do some research on seizures next thing I knew I was screwing up my courage to call the top epilepsy surgeon at Children's Hospital Boston uh, who was the dad of another student I'm like, hi Dr. Madsen my name is Rosalind Picard do you know if it's possible for somebody having a grand mal seizure to also have this large sympathetic nervous system response? I wanted to use the medical terminology. Uh, I didn't want to tell him it was just on one side because I thought that was too loony. And he said, hmm, that's interesting. He says, I don't think that's likely, but he said it's interesting because we've had patients whose hair stands on end on one arm. 20 minutes before a seizure. And I had told him this peak looked like it was 20 minutes before the boy had marked it in the seizure. Uh, and he got interested. I said, on one arm? Yeah, I told him this was a lateralized phenomenon. Uh, he got interested. We got safety certified, the sensors, um, Institute Review Board checking our protocol. And next thing you know, we've enrolled 90 children in this gold standard study with video EEG, ECG, and now EDA, electrodermal activity, what we were measuring for stress, 24-7. Uh, and we found for 100% of the grand mal seizures, there was a significant skin conductance response associated with it. Usually not 20 minutes in advance and usually not on just one side. Usually it was a generalized seizure and we got a response on both sides. And usually the response when precisely timed happened right when the electrical activity in the brain was going off. That insight and some other ones that led us to understand the connection between the size of this response and a period of flattened brain activity following the seizure led us to want to develop these devices for commercial use. That's what led to the work that Empatica is doing today, uh, building Embrace Watch to enable people to have real-time AI detected seizures and summon help so that they have a better chance of being healthy after the seizure. I think AI has the potential to do a lot of good or a lot of bad. We have seen technology uh, change people's lives so that on Friday and Saturday night, they're home alone, spending all their time on social media instead of connecting on the phone or in person with each other. And that's even before COVID-19 hit. I think it's really important with each technology that we think through what is it doing to enhance the things that really improve human life? And what is it doing that might be uh, making us say, gee, we thought that was cool, but I'm not sure people are really doing any better. And we need to be self-critical. Sometimes we think it's helping connect people, but it's only doing a little bit of connecting and then it becomes, uh, 
like a bad habit where we don't actually connect in person. So with each technology, I think we need to look at the fact that it has both the potential for good and not good and help people figure out how to use it in ways that are good, just like food. Food can be really good. Too much of it can be not good. Uh, and too little of it, of course, is not good. So we need to think through that technology isn't simply good or bad, but each technology has potential for good use and bad use. Uh, and then we want to think about what kind of world do we want to build? And this is where we especially need women who have lots of great insights about, you know, what kind of world have we built now? What kind of world could we build that's better? And how do we shape the AI and the way people use it and their awareness of good and bad uses so that it doesn't lead to less social interaction or less real human connection, um, but enhances and augments things that we think are good about being human and good about promoting well-being in life. Over the years at MIT, there's some things about female students that have been the same and some things that have changed. One of the things that's been the same is our female students in engineering and science are smart and hardworking. And you can't be just smart, you have to be smart and hardworking. And if you're not the smartest, but you're really hardworking, you can still do amazingly well. One of the things that has changed, however, is I think that women are freer now to really be more female. When I started out, there were so few women that some guys, when they saw me coming, would just look really nervous. <laughs> and I thought, okay, I need to fit in because I need to make them comfortable. So I would dress more like a guy wearing like, you know, the blue pants and the white shirt and just try to talk technical and fit in and make them feel like I was just one of the guys. If instead I wore a real girly outfit, you know, if they see cleavage or something, then they treat you like you're going on a date. And that is not the way I wanted to be treated when I wanted to be taken seriously. If you dress like you're going on a date in the lab, then you're probably gonna be treated like you're on a date. And that is great for a date, uh, but I don't think that's the best way to be taken seriously in the lab. So even though I think now we're a lot freer to dress a bit more feminine, I think we still need to uh, appear professional. Otherwise, we invite behavior that is not professional. I, I have two pieces of advice for women in STEM. Um, number one, find what you love. If you can find something that you really enjoy, that you're excited to wake up and do, that is such a gift and such a blessing. And you will find that you will do it well. And the better you do it, the more joy it can bring because you become very uh, respected for your skills in that area and you can contribute amazing things when you have that depth and that significant technical ability. So find something you love and really work hard to be the best at it. I think that's number one. Uh, number two, you may have noticed sometimes somebody is the best at something, but the boss thinks somebody else is the best at something even though they're not. Usually the person whose work is seen as the best, okay? Now, I'm differentiating here. There is being the best and there's being seen as the best. And those are two different things. If you want to also be seen as the best, then it's not enough to just be the best. You have to also know how to communicate and build relationships. You have to make sure your boss knows about the great work you're doing. You have to make sure that if you write technical papers, the busy people out there who don't have time to read anything <laughs> get a special note saying, hey, your work really helped me here. I've, I've not only cited you, but I've built on your results. Look at figure two. Uh, thank you for making these contributions that enabled me to go a little further. Uh, communicating, showing gratitude, 
smiling and sharing your joy and building relationships and sharing your enthusiasm. Those skills are what make the difference between doing great work and not being noticed and doing great work and people receiving it and appreciating it and you getting really the credit and the recognition and the opportunities that enable that great work to go out and do much more good than it does when it's just locked in the lab. I have had a lot of rejections. My first job I was rejected from, first faculty position I applied for, my first proposal was rejected, my first paper was rejected. Uh, I, but I don't keep, other than those three, I, I've forgotten the rest. I don't keep track of them. I don't count them. Once I heard some numbers from a top lab at MIT that something like eight out of 10 of their proposals were rejected. And I thought, <laughs> you know, if most of them are going to be rejected, so be it. You have to keep trying. Don't let it discourage you. Even when I was up for tenure, and I knew that, you know, most people don't get tenure, I kept a list in my little notebook that I would see regularly of all the other cool jobs I could do and be happy if I got, if my tenure got rejected someday. So if I ever started feeling a little too stressed out about tenure or whatever I was going for, I'd pull out that list, I'd say a little prayer for wisdom, and I would see that, you know, there will be other ways to be meaningful and to do work with purpose and to find joy. It doesn't have to be the first thing you go after. So I find, number one, don't let rejection get you down. Just look for other great stuff you can do. Um, number two, don't count them. <laughs> uh, just take the feedback, take the criticism, and that's a gift. I read what the critics write, and I think, wow, I didn't, I didn't think about that perspective. Or, you know, well, they got it wrong. How could I have worded it so that people don't get it so wrong? Uh, it is a way of showing you how to make things better. And I don't know about you, but I love the opportunity to improve and make things better. So criticism, failure, if they give you feedback, it's a gift. If they don't give you feedback, ask for it. Say, all right, um, could you tell me, uh, you know, how that could have done better? And if they're really nice, they'll also tell you some things that were good about it. Uh, but have a tough skin, ask for feedback, and use it to make things better. And I think you'll find that then sometimes you will succeed. And in any case, you will find joy because you're making things better, you're learning, and you're the one in control of your feelings. That happiness shouldn't come from things that happen to you. That happiness comes from within, from knowing that you're learning, you're doing the best, and you're expending your effort in a worthy cause. A message for women techies in India. Number one, keep learning. Seek knowledge, seek wisdom. Learning is itself a pleasure. And when you can also have the gift of converting what you learn into something that helps others, that just amplifies the pleasure. And that's something you can take delight in. Number two is take care of yourself. Uh, absolutely don't don't just try to achieve aims based on uh, things that pad out your resume at the end of this life nobody wishes that they had more publications or earned more money or had a higher title in their job uh, people wish that they had developed greater relationships and friendships and developed more meaning and purpose with things that really matter in life I think it's so important today more than ever to take care of your well-being, uh, to take care of your mental health, to make sure that you are solid in knowing your purpose and meaning, your, your spiritual goals, your social relationships, knowing who matters to you and letting them know that they matter to you. 
taking care of your sleep, making sure that you get seven to nine hours of sleep a night. And if you don't have good sleep, get cognitive behavioral therapy to support your sleep, taking care of your physical activity, take care of your body. That's part of your, your brain is part of your body. You need sports and activity to feel good about yourself, take care of your diet. We need to take care of ourselves and each other. And more than ever, you can't be a great techie if you aren't also taking care of your health. So put your health first. Make sure that you uh, are taking care of yourself because you're really important. You really matter. And when you do that, and then you can have extra joy to share with learning and developing super cool technology and thinking about what kind of world we really want to build so that the cool technology we build makes our world a better place, not just for us techies, uh, but for everybody. Everybody and all those people we love and all those people that we will hopefully get to meet in the future whose lives will be better because of our efforts. Thank you so much for listening to my input and I look forward to hearing your ideas and suggestions uh, how our community can do more to build a great future for everyone. Thank you so much.